talk I'm giving is a kind of commission talk. Karen asked me to address this particular area, and I'm looking at research and meta-analyses into teaching. And I came up with this title. Could you read the title aloud to your partner? C can you do it again so I can hear? Yeah, there's a bit of variation there. The, the correct pronunciation is what might work rather than what might work. This is a, this is a presentation which necessarily is very sort of tentative in any conclusions uh, that I may or may not reach. But I'm looking at a, that a number of big research projects, looking at what uh, they discovered from these big research projects and looking at the extent to which we might apply these insights into our own worlds. So I'm looking fundamentally at the world of meta-analyses. Now, a meta-analysis is simply a statistical procedure for comparing uh, different analyses. The biggest meta-analyses may take um, hundreds, occasionally hundreds, of research projects. And the uh, writers of the meta-analysis are looking for statistical tools which will enable them to bring all of this different research together and come up with some kind of firm conclusion. The reason why meta-analyses have become popular in recent years, well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, I think that we have witnessed a, a massive growth in quantitative evaluation of things. We want numbers. Everything has to be accountable, and this is partly to do with budget squeezes. So if we're going to implement some kind of educational innovation, uh, we need to have some idea in advance that it's likely to work, and therefore we need numbers to justify that. So that's one reason. There is a a culture of accountability which requires numbers. But I think there is a second reason in our own particular field, and we're seeing uh, this very recent growth uh, in meta-analyses in language teaching, in English language teaching, and that is because our field is relatively young. The, the literature on language teaching, theoretical literature, is really relatively young. It exploded in the 1970s. It had kind of, kind of got going in the 1920s, but only in the 1970s and the establishment of university departments around the world has it really got going? And in the early days of language teaching, which was and remains dominated by English language teaching, our world was uh, dominated by what we might call eduquacks. If you're on Twitter, check out the hashtag eduquack, and it'll take you very quickly to a blog called The Learning Scientists, whose uh, mission is to expose any false claims that are made about education. And it was quite interesting in Tim Oates' talk earlier on, he, he asked the room, had you seen Ken Robinson's uh, YouTube video? And then he said, it's dreadful. Ken Robinson is a, is a very good example of what I would call an eduquack, someone who's making pronouncements about what's wrong with education and what we should do, based on both very, very sketchy or false research, a lack of awareness about the past, and a lack of knowledge or awareness of the present. He may be very inspirational, but what he says isn't actually grounded in any firm research. And there are many, many other cases. Um, I'm not going to talk about specific uh, ELT cases, but in the broader world of education, I would also include among eduquacks Bill Gates and the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is influencing educational policy all around the world, promoting technology and personalization without any research basis behind it. This is an ideological move. Another example might be Mark Zuckerberg with the Zuckerberg Chan Foundation, which is promoting very similar things. Zuckerberg is not somebody who knows anything about education, but he has come to believe that personalization is the solution. And he's a man who, through tens and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars at a particular project in Newark, which failed completely. Now, that might be quite an interesting learning experience, uh, but how much more wisely that money could have been spent. So we have had a history of eduquacks, um, and it's time we moved away from them. So I'm looking at <coughs> the, the research field, and if we're talking about meta-analyses, we have to start with John Hattie. John Hattie's book, Visible Learning, which was also referenced twice earlier on today, came out in 2009, and it's almost certainly the most influential book in educational research now. Hattie's book uh, was a synthesis, he chooses the word synthesis, of 800 meta-analyses, which in turn referenced 50,000 different pieces of research. 
It was a huge, huge undertaking. And although I'm going to move on to critique the work of Hattie in a fairly radical way, I do strongly recommend everyone to have a, a good look at the work of Hattie. There are other books which are followed on from Visible Learning, uh, but this is the key one. Hattie took all of these uh, meta-analyses and he came up with what he calls and what other statisticians call an effect size. And he represented this on a rather quaintly old-fashioned barometer, a barometer of influence. So any particular educational intervention can be measured through the research and it can be given a statistical number, a figure, which he will then put on this barometer, what he calls the barometer of influence. And we'll look at some specific examples. The print is a little bit small there, but within that semicircle, on the left-hand side, we've got reverse effects. So anything which statistically comes up in reverse effects means it has a negative impact on student learning outcomes. We can all think of a few things which would fit into this part of the semicircle. Uh, whacking children, for example, physically hitting them, has been demonstrated massively time and time again to be counterproductive educationally. Don't do it. But there may well be other things which we do which have a negative influence. The next little segment there he calls developmental effects. And these are the kinds of uh, changes in student learning outcomes which could be expected just because a child is getting older. They're maturing cognitively. So if a particular educational intervention shows an effect size which falls in that developmental effects segment, it means it hasn't had any effect because that effect would have taken place irrespective of the intervention. Okay? <clears throat> the third segment there, teacher effects, these, uh, the, the extent of effect which we might expect just in the normal course of a year's teaching, just the fact that a kid is sitting in a classroom with a teacher and the teacher's doing her normal stuff. So again, anything which falls into teacher effects is not a particularly positive effect, it's just something which we could predict would happen. So what we're really going to be interested in are what come in the zone of desired effects. Um, I tell you now, nothing hits 1.1 or 1.2 on the scale. Nothing gets anywhere near there. We get a few just under 1.0. So this is what uh, Hattie's work is about. Um, before we look at a bit more detail, there's a couple of things that I need to point out. First of all, in order to do this st statistical analysis, we have to have data, we have to have quantitative data. This means that any qualitative research cannot be factored into the meta-analysis. So it may be that you have a particular intervention. Let's say the intervention is to try out a new course book. Well, we can measure student scores at the beginning, at the end, or through the middle. We can get data of that kind, but we can't measure qualitative information, which might include things like, how did the teacher feel about using this material? Or how did the students feel? So the effects tend to be relatively short-term. I mean, by short-term, I mean within a year, rather than the kind of effects which take place over four or five years. So the first thing is it's about quantitative data, and that is not qualitative data. And in learning and teaching, qualitative data is often much, much more interesting, often more revealing. First point. The second important point to understand, and I've, I've been quite... Uh, strict in the way I presented the slides, which you'll see, is that effect size doesn't tell us anything about causes. It only tells us about correlations. So we have a particular intervention which happens to correlate with improved learning outcomes. But it doesn't mean that one was the direct result or the cause of the other. It's only correlational. So it can't ever lead us to making uh, big decisions about what to do in our educational institutions or our classes. You can only inform them. And this is something which we've learned from the world of medicine because the whole world of evidence-based medicine has influenced teaching. Evidence-based medicine is beginning to die a death. And we're now talking about evidence-informed medicine. So doctors are using the meta-analyses, but they're not relying on them. Because, again, the relationship is correlational, not causal. The, the third big point before we move on as a sort of a caveat is this. We're attempting to do science here. We're attempting to use numbers to come up with some scientific insight into fairly complex processes. 
But science is not fundamentally about proving anything. Science is fundamentally about disproving things. It's quite easy to set up, well, quite easy to set up experiments to try to disprove something. That is the scientific method. But very hard to set up an experiment which will prove something. So as an example, we can set up experiments, and we have set up experiments, to investigate whether a policy of English only in an English language class is beneficial or not. That's the hypothesis, and we can run the experiment, and we can see whether we can disprove it. And when it comes to the English-only policy in teaching English, the evidence is very clear. We can disprove that hypothesis. There is no gain with English-only approaches. But it's much harder to come up with an experiment which says, well, OK, let's imagine that we use um, the shared language, the first language, for grammatical explanations. Can we set up an experiment which proves that would be beneficial? And the simple answer is we can't. It's too difficult to set up. There are too many variables. So we can disprove things, but we can't easily prove things. One more example, because the research has been done, we could imagine with our hypothesis that learners fall into different categories of learned styles. We could imagine, for example, that learners are either visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And we can then tailor instruction to meet those learning styles. And we can measure the outcomes. And this has been done, and it's been repeated a number of times. And the research evidence is fairly clear. Attempting to categorize students into visual, auditory, and kinesthetic doesn't help in any way. It's not a reliable measure. And tailoring instruction to meet those styles has been proven to lead to no gains in outcomes. So we can disprove things, but we can't easily prove things. These are my words of warning, first of all. So back to Hattie, and Hattie has been talked about a lot, and some of the answers you may already know. Some big things. Homework. Does giving students more homework improve learning outcomes? So if, for example, instead of the uh, half an hour a day, which they do, we upped it to an hour, would that help? Class size. If we reduced the class size, would that help? On the plane coming in here yesterday, I was talking to a, a, an English primary school teacher who uh, was working in Luton with kids of six, seven, until a year ago. She had 30 in a class. She's now working in a private uh, primary school in Moscow where she's got seven in a class. How does that change things? So does class size have an impact on learning outcomes? Does the individualization of instruction, personalization or differentiation, whatever you want to call it, does that have an impact, however we define individualization? And what about frequent testing? If we give our students frequent tests, will they do better at the end? Which of these interventions do you think has the least correlation with improved learning outcomes? Frequent testing. Frequent testing, OK. Well, I, think, I might as well tell you now, frequent testing has the greatest correlation. Shit. Here are the... Uh, where's my clicker gone here? Here are the, uh, the answers. Now, you'll notice that all of these fall within that segment of teacher effects. In other words, none of them change very much at all. And this has led a lot of people to suggest changes in educational policy. In a number of countries around the world, this has led some politicians to suggest, OK, forget about class sizes. If it doesn't make any difference, let's bang more students in the class. Well, that teacher that I met on the plane felt that her job was doable with seven kids in the class, not least. Uh, because with 30, and with those 30, six of them had special needs, she simply couldn't manage the class. She couldn't, she said to me, she couldn't survive working in this primary school in Luton. She was cracking up. She had no family life, nothing really to live for. She had to get out of it. So she's a very counterfactual example there. We cannot assume, because of these results, that we should forget about class size. I'll come on to it in a second. There are other issues too, and homework is a good example. You have to drill down into the results to find out what they actually mean. When it comes to primary level children, the effect size of increased homework is virtually zero. Virtually zero. When you get up to uh, high school, the effect size is much greater. 
And when you get up to the end of high school, it's greater still. But this is all averaged out into one figure of 0.29, which looks very low. But we can't take that as a meaningful figure. So the first issue is the average which we're presented with is not a particularly informative average. You drill down a little bit further, too, and you'll discover, for example, it's not just age differentials that, that change everything. It's the subject, what kind of subject uh, they're doing homework for. Maths, for example, extra maths homework shows very clear learning gains. In the social sciences, the learning gains are minimal. So it depends on the subject that you're teaching. When it comes to languages, <coughs> we also have very clear evidence that in terms of the deliberate learning of vocabulary, time spent studying word lists or through apps is beneficial. That's a kind of homework, too, at the lower levels. So there's something wrong here in terms of the numbers, which Hattie's meta-analysis simply doesn't show us. So there's the age issue, there's the subject itself, and then there's the kind of homework. A lot of homework we know in all educational contexts is kind of busy work. Let's just give them something to do. Yeah? yeah? And in uh, language learning, it's often the workbook. And a lot of workbook material is, frankly, busy work. It doesn't particularly engage cognitively. Some of the better ones do. It's busy work. With younger children, this meta-analysis research suggests that project work has the least positive impact on outcomes, which is a bit of a shame for people like myself who believe very strongly that project work is a very valuable approach, but that's what it's showing. So I think we have to be very, very careful how we interpret this. The class size one is also very interesting, and this is, again, a problem with averages. If you drill down and you try to find out why this doesn't have an impact, the answer was very, very clear to Hattie, and that is reducing class size tends not to change teacher behavior. And since most teachers have developed an approach to teaching, which is essentially a chalk and talk model, most teachers have this, lecturing, kind of thing I'm doing now, it doesn't make any difference whether there's 30 or 200 or seven in the room. And I've seen this uh, very dramatically when I've been in Poland, where uh, high school kids are divided, or they used to be divided, uh, the class was divided into two, so you'd have about seven or eight kids in the room, but the teacher was still typically sitting at the other end of the room talking to the class as if there were 30 of them. So it's not actually about class size, it's about what the teacher is doing. So again, we have an issue here. Frequent testing, uh, just a quick word on frequent testing. Frequent testing comes out fairly low in Hattie's uh, meta-analysis synthesis, but as we'll see in a very short while, um, this figure contradicts other people's meta-analyses. So you, you wonder to what extent this is generalizable across the board. But as with the things at the bottom end of the scale, I, I want to problematize these too. I'd like to take study skills, which comes out as the lowest of the four here. Ask, is the training of study skills really not that significant? I mean, 0.59 is only just into the zone of desired effects. Well, surely it depends on what kind of uh, instruction the students are having. If we're talking about uh, some kind of educational setup where there is a focus on personalized learning and learner autonomy, where we want to encourage students to decide themselves what it is they're going to study and when they're going to study and how much they're going to study it, then we know that study skills is absolutely crucial because that's the context. Without that training in study skills, they can't develop the autonomy they need to work independently online. And uh, teacher clarity clearly is less of an issue in a context like that. So again, I think we need to be skeptical about what these results show, and I want to bring in a few more big areas here. First of all, the validity of the results depends entirely on the validity of the, ascent, the initial research which is being collated together. The decision whether or not to include a particular piece of research is, to some extent, anyway, subjective. So if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. In order to really make any decisions on these, on these figures, we'd have to go back to the original research and check out ourselves whether we think it's valid in our context. The second is that there are so many variables in the teaching learning situation that it's <coughs> very, very hard to identify one particular intervention which is independent of others. Here, for example, it's very, very difficult to imagine any way we can really separate out teacher clarity from a teacher-student relationship. 
Because if a teacher is lacking clarity, the relationship with the students is not likely to be good. And the teacher-student relationship is likely to be improved and reinforced by greater teacher clarity. So these two variables cannot really be separated out one from the other. There's no real way of doing that. And classrooms are very, very complex uh, spaces of social interaction. They don't lend themselves in the way that some medical interventions do to this kind of quantitative analysis. It's a complex world, and reducing it to figures on a barometer is not always the best way of going about it. But that is not to say that Hattie's effect sizes aren't useful. It's just they're not gospel. Put it like that. There's also the question of how generalizable these results are. Um, I have an issue when we're talking about ELT, because what does ELT mean? There are so many different contexts of English language teaching that it's very, very hard to generalize across those. Any, any kind of uh, article in an applied linguistics journal which says teachers should do this, should do that, should not do this, is problematic because it's almost certainly not the case that all teachers should do the same thing some of the time. It depends entirely on context. Most of the meta-analysis stuff that we have in general education and in language education is done with children, primary and secondary. And very, very little of it has been done with adult populations. And one of the reasons is that adult student populations vary enormously. The differences between, let's say, uh, an 18-year-old doing extra private language school classes in Spain to try to get through a particular exam, and let's say a university student who is doing a doctorate and is preparing for an international conference, you can't compare these populations. So how generalizable are they? And on the whole, the statistics, and all of the statistics I'm going to show you in this talk, mostly refer to primary and secondary populations. They're also mostly about developed first world countries, if I can use that term. Most of the data comes out of the US. Is it possible to compare the insights from, let's say, uh, a group of schools in Massachusetts with what is likely to take place in a group of schools in Kathmandu, for example? Almost certainly not. There are too many other variables taking place. So the generalization issue is, is, is a big one. The, the last big point that I want to make is, is this. All of these interventions in the meta-analyses come out as fairly small. The big differences in terms of student outcomes are not about educational interventions. The big differences that are identified, or the big causes of differences identified by the OECD are social differences. They are to do with the child's background, social and economic background, the extent to which the parents read books at home, the extent to which the parents are even present, the extent to which they even have parents. The biggest differences in all educational outcomes are to do with those social and economic backgrounds, which we cannot control educationally. And the eduquacks that I referred to earlier, the Gates and the Zuckerbergs, are trying to solve society's problems through education, but education on the whole reflects society's problems rather than changes them. Not that clear cut. So educational interventions may not in any case, be the way we should sort out these big, big differences in learner outcomes, which are essentially to do with poverty. So, moving on. Hat is the big one, but there are many others which are quoted quite a lot. The first of these, quite interestingly, uh, is more about the strategies, what teachers should actually do in their classrooms. And this came out uh, six, seven years ago in American Educator, and it's a list of things which all teachers should know. So as soon as I see all teachers should know, the alarm bells start ringing in my head. Why? Why? What do you mean all teachers? But again, I think it's uh, interesting to have a look at this, and I've uh, made a selection so that the, the strategies which all teachers should know, I've selected those most relevant to language teaching. And these are the principles, the big ones, five of them. I'll give you a second to read that. I don't think there's anything very controversial here, is there? I think it's kind of what you would expect to find. But a, a few observations. 
Firstly, this uh, meta-analysis draws primarily on STEM subjects and particularly mathematics in coming up with the results. Can we generalize across to language teaching and language learning? And I'm not sure that we can. There is a difference. I'll come on to it in a second. The, uh, the other thing is, of course, this is about children. All this data comes from looking at children's performance in schools. Can we generalize across to adults? And I'm not sure that we can. But the big issue here is, I think, to do with what is actually being measured. There is a focus all of the time now on student outcomes, but student outcomes are only things that can be measured. But there are many, many student outcomes that can't be measured. I would have thought that for anyone involved in English language or language education, one of the most desirable outcomes would be to promote in the students a love of the language, an interest in the language, and a love of learning the language. These seem to me absolute fundamentals, but these don't lend themselves to metrical evaluation. What we can measure easily and quickly and cheaply are things perhaps which we're not so concerned about. We can measure grammatical accuracy very quickly, very cheaply, very easily. But is that what we're about? We can measure vocabulary knowledge, particularly receptive vocabulary knowledge, very easily and very cheaply, and it may correlate with performance measures. But is that what it's all about? Because the thing that's terribly striking about this kind of research is that this is all about knowledge that children must acquire. This is all about knowledge, maths style or geography style. And it's not about skills or performance. So we need to be very careful in adopting or changing, our, adapting our practices based on information like this. If our interest is in skills development, when this simply tell us, tells us about knowledge gains. And that is, I think, a fundamental difference between maths and geography and language education. So again, I think there are big reasons to be skeptical. Language acquisition is different from the acquisition of mathematical skills because mathematical skills are, by and large, linear. You can construct knowledge trees, and you can decide what is the best way to progress from A to Z. With languages, we try to do it in our course book syllabuses, but we know that language acquisition is not linear. Certainly, grammatical acquisition is not linear in any way at all, and vocabulary acquisition is probably not linear either. So maybe we're using the wrong model to look at this anyway. So Rosenshine is, is interesting, but maybe not quite the right thing to follow. But it's worth knowing about. Although, of course, this may be relevant, particularly at the lower levels of language learning. When you're starting a language and you need rapidly to acquire, let's say, a couple of thousand high-frequency vocabulary items, that is about knowledge. Not only, but it is about knowledge. So maybe this is relevant at the lower levels much more than it is at the higher levels. The one thing that I find particularly interesting here is the fourth bullet point, obtain a high success rate. And I find this interesting because it tells us something which we really do know. In order for students to be successful, they need to be motivated. But in order to be motivated, they need to be successful. So any kind of evaluation system which is failing more than half the class, which is fairly common in many educational systems, is not just a failure for the kids, it's a failed system. The system has been badly designed. We should always be constructing our programs so that the majority of kids in any class, or adults for that matter, will be succeeding. It's not about transmitting a syllabus, which is beyond them, it's pointless. So I think that's a, a kind of generalizable uh, one in the way that the others aren't. But the other things here are what we, I think, systematically do. You look at course book production and development now, almost always it begins with review of something that's come before. We review at the end. Um, we do monthly, weekly reviews. We do all of these things, so we're kind of taking it on board. So, it's the Rosenstein. Next one, quick look at the next one. Dunlowski et al. This has been widely quoted. Uh, you can download these free online. Uh, and this has perhaps been more widely quoted in the world of language teaching than any of the others. I've taken, again, a selection of the kinds of techniques that Dunlowski and his team investigated, and I've chosen those which, again, are most relevant to language learning and language teaching. 
Practice testing, we know, this, when we talk about practice testing, we're talking about low stakes practice testing. So typically a student, a teacher will not be recording the score and putting that score towards an end of semester mark. Distributed practice or spaced repetition, meaning that you don't mass the practice of, let's say, a grammatical structure or whatever it may be, all in one block. You spread it over a period of time using the principles of spaced repetition, which are used in all of the vocabulary apps. Interleaved practice means that you uh, cut up whatever it is you're studying in a class with other things. So you don't have a whole lesson on the present perfect for unfinished past or whatever it may be. You'll chop that up with other activities in the middle so that other things are taking place. Yeah? And if it's simply a question of memorization, interleave practice suggests that rather than spending half an hour studying a list of words, you'd stop after five minutes and do something else. I don't know, listen to a song, uh, read a little text, and then go back afterwards and go back to your study, interleave practice. The fourth elaborative interrogation um, is perhaps best illustrated in a recent book, which is a very interesting book by Danny Norrington Davis, and it's called something like Teaching Grammar from Rules to Reasons, in which he argues that um, instead of getting students to state grammatical rules, we should get them to give the reasons why a particular language form is used. So it's encouraging students to articulate reasons for why language is as it is. Elaborative interrogation. The next one, highlighting, underlining, is, is a, as old as it comes, you know, just underlining with a marker pen or a red pen anything interesting or useful, which is, of course, what many of our students do as a revision technique, very popular. And the last one, using keyword mnemonics or pictures, images, as, as an example, the learning of vocabulary. So you take a word that you're trying to learn, you think of a, a word in your own language which sounds a bit like it, you think of a picture you associate with it, and you create this associative network of pictures and other things in order to learn the word. A popular technique um, recommended in many contexts. So, the extent to which this uh, is appropriate or relevant to language learning is still questionable, but it does suggest that our dislike, because I think collectively there has been a dislike of practice tests over the years, has been a little premature. There was a time when it was very, very fashionable to laugh about books like English Grammar in Use by Raymond Murphy. Ha ha, Murphy. Well, no. Maybe we got things a little bit wrong. Students always loved doing Murphy's work. It was always very popular. And it's often instructive to look at what students like doing. Practice testing is clearly a very good way of building your knowledge base. So long as it's low stakes testing and the kids don't feel threatened by it, peer testing, anything, it doesn't really matter. Or it could be an app. So long as the data on the app is not being captured by the teacher. Because as soon as that happens, it's not low stakes anymore, it's high stakes. So these are the things which Danlowski suggests um, are of importance to consider. And again, Maybe, maybe we should reevaluate some of the things that we've been getting rid of or things that we have been doing. And maybe we shouldn't. It can only inform our practice, not tell us what to do. <laughs> to wrap up, we should come to teacher development. There are a couple of uh, big meta-analyses uh, that are available. I've chosen this one from the Teacher Development Trust. The other one, which you'll find references to very quickly, has many of the same uh, members of the team on the project. So it's called Developing Great Teaching, Lessons from the International Views into Effective Professional Development. And in a sense, I have to finish with this because this is a teacher development event. This, this is what we're doing here, or a manager, teacher-manager event. I said it early on that all of this stuff is much easier disproving things than proving things. And I've been trying to focus on the positive sides of things we might consider rather than the negative sides. But given the particular context in which I find myself, I thought, let's go back to the negatives. In teacher development, if we don't focus on improved learning outcomes for students, then teacher development programs tend to have very, very little impact on teaching. Although there is a certain circularity here because that's the way it's being measured. But the suggestion very clearly is that we should always have a consideration of student outcomes. So as an example of a TD program that doesn't focus on improved learning outcomes would be a program, for example, that over a period of four weeks, once a week, 
uh, instructs teachers on how to use the interactive whiteboard creatively. There is no focus on outcomes there at all. It's a technical thing, and those programs tend to have relatively little impact. Does that mean we shouldn't be giving training to our teachers on using the whiteboard creatively? No, I don't think so. But we have to be cognizant of its limitations. Teacher development programs that simply tell teachers what to do also have very little impact. To what extent have I been telling you what to do or what not to do? It's very difficult when you're lecturing to avoid the telling. So it goes. The positive things, one, the biggest impact comes from long-term integrated programs, not the one-off drive-by workshops which characterize most teacher development. And one-off drive-by workshops include things like this particular session. This is a one-off thing about meta-analyses. How valuable will it be? be to you. I would like to think that it would be quite valuable because it'll raise questions which will stay with you for quite a long time. But I may be wrong. Maybe the only way that I could get that message across would be over a longer period of time. I don't know. Certainly when we ask teachers what they think of teacher development programs, the most frequent criticism is that they get these one-off drive-by workshops and then next week it's something different. So they don't like them. The next, it has to be relevant to teachers' day-to-day -day concerns. In Austria, where I live, there's a big push to integrate more technology into the classrooms. Um, and every time I'm working with teachers on teacher development courses, they breathe a sigh of relief when I tell them, one, we're not going to be talking about technology. And two, we're not going to be talking about changes to the new Matura exam, because that's all they get. They simply don't see that as particularly relevant to their practices. Their concerns are primarily to do with discipline and how on earth do you manage to teach a class of 27 kids when 26 of them don't speak German, let alone English. Those are their concerns. So when somebody comes along and talks about whatever, they simply don't listen. So there has to be some kind of buy-in, and that means that teachers would need to be involved in some way in the development, the construction of the program before the program starts. The history of teach development is a history of failure when it's imposed top-down. It's always failed. We know that, don't we? I think, but we still carry on doing it. Well, I do. This research also found that the bringing in of external specialists helped. It led to positive gains in student outcomes. I find this quite surprising. And I haven't had the time to dig down to find out why they suggest this. The biggest argument seems to be that if it's all done in-house, people share the same kind of language, the same frame of reference, and you need an external person to come along and take a different perspective on it. But I think it would really depend on what it is you wanted the teacher development program to achieve. The other question, of course, about external specialists is they cost a lot more. And will it be cost effective? It's almost never the case that it's going to be worthwhile flying somebody in from the States or from Britain or Australia or wherever at massive, massive cost to do one week of this or that. But people still do it. I mean, as a, as a teacher trainer, I, I'm very happy because it's nice work. But I'm not sure that it's going to be cost effective. The research also suggests that leadership Clear educational leadership is a necessary part of any teacher development program. Again, I wonder about this because I'm not too sure what leadership actually means. I've never yet come across what I consider to be a satisfactory definition. But it's something we should clearly think about. And if I were, which I'm not, if I were in the position of setting up the teacher development programs in the context in, where, in Austria where I work, I would have to find out more what this meant. I'd have to turn to or somebody who would know more about it. To conclude all of this, and this is from John Dewey, so we're going back nearly 100 years, you cannot take any scientific research into education and convert it immediately into rules of educational art. It simply is not that clear. The more data we get doesn't necessarily mean the more that we learn. Now, with a move towards more platform-driven education and greater use of apps, we're capturing huge amounts of data. And the belief, at least on the part of those who are selling 
that technology, is that in the end, when we have enough data, we just have to tweak the algorithms a few more times, and there will lead automatically to positive learning recommendations for teachers. The converse is probably true. More data doesn't lead to more insights. Less higher quality data might do, but the kind of random data capturing that we're using on the platforms and with apps is not really going to help us. So there is no direct route from this research into practice. Unfortunately, wouldn't it be nice if we could just go away from here? Right, OK, let's do lots of interleave practice or whatever it might be. We can't go down that route. So the question uh, which I kind of ducked in the title, I ducked the question of what works because we cannot ever say what works. And I ducked it by changing the title to what might work. But a better way of asking the question would be this. Where and when does something work? And who might it work with? It always has to be context specific because educational contexts vary so much. Anyone who comes across as an educational guru who's got the solution is talking nonsense. We'll use this research to inform our practice. We need to map it onto teachers' experiences and we need to map it onto and their uh, practical knowledge and we need to map it onto students' experiences as well. And somewhere in the middle there, we may find approaches which are going to make sense. So we need to move away from this sort of eduquack, somebody telling you what to do. But the solution is not to go simply to research and to meta-analyses, because they're flawed as well. There has to be a coming together of all of these things. So that is why evidence-based teaching has very quickly gone out of fashion as a term. Evidence-informed as with evidence-informed medicine, but it is an art and not a science. Thank you. <laughs>